first of all, welcome to everybody. So we will have presentations in each session, one after the other, and we will take uh, questions all together at the end. I will give the speakers now 22 minutes. I'll keep the time. And for questions, please write them in the chat. I will not look at the raised hands in WebEx. I will look at the chat. Please put your affiliation, your name, if it's not already clear, your question, so that I can maybe group them together. And if it's a clarification question, can you please write clarify? So maybe the authors, the co-authors of the speaker could already solve some of these clarification ses uh, questions in the chat. So we have more time for more substantial discussions at the end. Now, you are all muted. At some point, I may ask uh, some of you to read your question aloud or to just ask your question. In that case, please accept uh, the request to unmute and then you will be able to speak. Once you mute yourself again, you will have to be given the possibility again. So you're locked, so to speak, for this session. Now, let me uh, get to the content and put in a plug for Prisma. Isabel already mentioned that we have a research network within the European System Central Bank called uh, Prisma, um, which, is, which stands for a Price Setting Microdata Analysis Network. The following two papers are uh, indeed by members, participants in this research network, and uh, so I thought uh, to remind you of that. Uh, you have information on the web page of the ECB. Uh, subscribe to that page, uh, put it in your bookmarks, because as the papers come out, we will uh, list them there so you can stay on track with the uh, production, research production of this network. Now, Andrea, uh, you can start to share your uh, slides. You are presenter now. You should be able to share your slides. This is a paper joined with Alvarez, Gauthier, Le Bihan, and Lippi. Andrea, yes, yes. we see Can your slides. See the slides? Very good. Yes, yes perfect. Hello, everyone. Great. Thank you very much for having us. I'm going to present the paper, an empirical investigation of the sufficient statistic for monetary shock. This paper is co-authored with uh, Alvarez, Gauthier, Le Bihan, and Lippi. Uh, in a, in recent works, uh, uh, Alvarez, Lippi, and co-authors have established a new theoretical result for the propagation of monetary shock. This result is called the sufficient statistic proposition. This proposition tells us that in a multi-sector economy with free trial price setting, the cumulative response of output of an industry to a monetary shock uh, is equal to the ratio of the Kurtosian frequency of price changes times uh, delta, the monetary shock, divided by uh, epsilon times six, where epsilon is the labor elasticity. When the cumulative response, to be precise, is the uh, cumulative inputs response function, which is the integral of the uh, inputs response function. Uh, from now on, I will, I, will, uh, the, I will call this object as the response. The novelty of uh, this, uh, this result uh, stand in underlying the importance of the kurtosis in explaining the propagation of monetary shock. Kurtosis intuitively is important because it measures the lack of the so-called selection effect. On the other hand, the importance of frequency is pretty well known in the literature because frequency represents the time units of the model. Uh, this is a theoretical result that holds in a in a broad class of model. For example, it holds in random menu cost models as the one of Calvo, Calvo Plus, or Golos of Lucas. It also holds in rational attention models as the one of race, but it's also old in multi-product models. This is the theoretical result that holds as, under some assumption. For example, uh, in the model, the model must feature small inflation. Furthermore, the firms, when they adjust their prices, must, this, must set the price equal to the optimal one. We say in the literature, we say that the, the first must close the gap. Furthermore, the shock in the model are all Brownian. For example, this result does not hold in, uh, in a model with uh, price plans or in a model with temporary price changes. Uh, the aim of our paper is to uh, empirically test and explore the validity of these uh, 
uh, theoretical result. To, to do this, we will use uh, uh, micro and sectoral data on consumer price and, pro and producer price data for the French economy. And we are going to exploit the uh, across sector variability. The main challenge of our work is to estimate the uh, response of uh, different sectors to a monetary shock and to estimate the uh, micro moments of the same sectors. For example, we are going to estimate the frequency and the curtodis of price changes. Uh, before telling the empirical strategy that we're going to adopt, I want to state the uh, sufficient statistic proposition as the uh, response of prices and not as the response of output. I want to do this because we have better and more data for prices. Uh, after some algebra that uh, I'm not showing, we can uh, state the sufficient statistic proposition in the following way. The response of prices in sector J up to time T must be equal to the monetary shock delta times T minus the ratio of the frequency and the curtodis of price changes times delta, the monetary shock, divided by six. Furthermore, we can disentangle the effect of curtodis and frequency to, uh, to see if both of them are statistically significant. To do this, we can take a first order Taylor expansion around the mean of the frequency and the curtodis. When we do this, we obtain that the, the response of prices must be equal to a constant minus the uh, delta, the monetary shock, times the mean of the curtosis, divided by six times the mean of the frequency, times the curtosis, plus the same coefficient uh, times the frequency. Uh, from these two uh, equations is uh, quite clear how we are going to uh, test the Empiric, the, the sufficient statistic proposition. We want to uh, run a across sector regression in, uh, in view of this equation. This is exactly what we are going to do, and we report the two regression in this table. The first regression that we're going to, to want to run is that to, to regress the response of prices over a constant and the ratio of the curtosis and the frequency. Once we normalize the monetary shock delta to minus 1%, we have the prediction for our coefficients. According to the theory, uh, alpha, the coefficient of the constant, must be negative and equal to minus t. The coefficient on the ratio must be uh, equal to 1 over 6. However, if in the model we allowed for strategic complementarities, we have one more degree of freedom for the coefficient beta. As I told you before, we, uh, we took a Taylor expansion of the first order to inspect the significance of frequency and curtosis. When we do this, we can run a regression of the response of prices over a constant, the frequency, and the curtosis. The theory, in this case, predicts that the coefficient on the frequency and the curtosis must be the same in absolute value. Please remember these two regressions because are our two baseline regressions that we are going to estimate later. But, however, before estimate them, let me tell you the empirical strategy that we adopt. Our empirical strategy will consist in three steps using uh, French data on PPI and CPI. In the first step, we want to construct the left-hand side variable of the above-mentioned regression. Uh, to, do do, to do this, we will implement factor momentum VR using sectoral and aggregate time series. This way, we can obtain the response of different sectors uh, of prices. In the second step, we are going to use micro data on CPI and PPI, and we will construct uh, uh, the frequency and the curtosis of price changes. Once we have constructed uh, the frequency and the curtosis, we are done with the right hand side objects of our regression. And this is possible, and then it's possible in the third step to relate them using an across sector regression, regressing the response of prices over the frequency and the curtosis, which is this is exactly our third step. Let me start with the first step. In the first step, as I told you, we implement a factor oriented VAR following Bernanke, Poven, and Elias. In our case, the factor oriented VAR is just a VAR in which the uh, interest rate, in our case, the three month Euribor, is known. And there are some unknown factors that must be estimated. We estimate these unknown factors using a large number of time series in which we include the uh, sectoral PPI and CPI. Using the factor of VR is possible to retrieve the input response function 
of these large number of time series that we, are, that, we, that we use to estimate the factor. For example, in our case, we are able to estimate the uh, sectoral input response function of, price, of PPI and CPI. Once we have the input response function, is straightforward to uh, estimate, to cal uh, calculate the cumulative input response function, which is just the integral of the input response function. We will integrate the input response function up to two years or three years. As every VAR, we need a identification, identification assumption to retrieve the uh, monetary shocks. To do this, our bench line identification is to use a Cholesky identification plus a long run restriction. The long run restriction in our case is that all the sectoral prices must have the same response in the, in the long run. In our case, they must have the response of minus 1%. The other two uh, alternative identification that we're going to use is a Cholesky without long run restriction and use uh, high frequency data as instrumental variable. Uh, in, the in this figure, we report the estimated input response function uh, using our benchmark uh, identification, it means long run restriction plus Cholesky. On the left panel, we have the uh, input response function for PPI. On the right one, we have a response for CPI. Uh, the dashed red line is the uh, input response function for some sectors. The, uh, the thick red line is just a unweighted average of them. And the uh, blue line is the input response function of an aggregate uh, measure of the PPI on the left panel and panel for CPI. On the x-axis, we have the time after the shock, and on the y-axis, we have lock points in deviation from the steady state. From this figure, for example, from the PPI, the left panel, you can see that all the uh, input response function in the long run goes back to the level minus 1%, minus 1%. And furthermore, you can see that there is a, a variability in which the uh, different sectors respond to a monetary shock. Once we have the input response function, as I told you, it's possible to construct the cumulative inputs just integrating the integrating the dash that line for each sector up to uh, two years or three years. This way, we have construct the left hand side variables of our main uh, of our main regression. We can now proceed with the second step. In the second step, we want to construct the right hand side object, which are the frequency and kurtosis of price changes. For PPI, we have around 120 sectors. For CPI, instead, we have around 220 sectors. In, uh, in the figure, we have in the top panel the uh, histogram for the frequency of price changes. In the bottom, we have the uh, histogram for the kurtosis of price changes. In yellow, we have uh, the, the, the histogram for PPI. In white, we have the one for CPI. From the top panel, you can see that the frequent, there are some sectors for CPI that have a very low frequency. These are the uh, services. Furthermore, from the bottom panel, you can see that the distribution of the kurtosis of, of CPI is more spread with respect to the one of PPI. Uh, however, both of them have a mean uh, kurtosis of around 4.5. Now that we have constructed the left hand side object and the right hand side object of our baseline specification, we can run our regression across sector. This is exactly what we are going to do now. So we, we regress the response of prices over a constant and the ratio of the kurtosis and frequency of price changes. In this table, we report the result using producer prices. In the, in the first two columns, we have the uh, response estimated using the Cholesky identification plus the long run restriction. In the third and fourth column, we have uh, the response estimated using uh, the Cholesky without using, in this case, the long run restriction. In the last two columns, instead, we have uh, the identification using high frequency data plus instrumental variable plus long run restriction. In the first row, you can see the coefficient of the uh, ratio of the kurtosis and the frequency. You can see that the coefficient is always positive 
and statistically significant different from zero, as what the sufficient statistic result predicts. Furthermore, the, the theory also predicts that the constant should be negative and statistically significant different from zero. And this is exactly what we, uh, we obtain. Uh, furthermore, as I told you, we can disentangle the effect of the Gaussian frequency using a first order Taylor expansion. When we do this, we uh, obtain that the response of prices must be, uh, we can, sorry, we can run a regression of the response of prices over a constant, the frequency, and the kurtosis of press changes. Our results are reported in this table, and also in this table, we are still using only producer prices. The column of this table are the uh, same as the previous one. In the first row, we report the coefficient for the uh, frequency, which is uh, always negative and statistically significant, significant different from zero, which is what the uh, sufficient statistic result predicts. Furthermore, in the second row, we can see that the kurtosis is always statistically significant from zero and positive. The constant, furthermore, is negative and statistically significant. These are all in line with what the theory predicts. Furthermore, the theory predicts that the, two, the coefficient of frequency and kurtosis should be uh, the same in absolute value. For example, inspecting the second column, we can see that the two coefficients are not far from each other. Indeed, when we run an F-test under the null that the two coefficients are the same in absolute value, we couldn't reject the null. Uh, there is a message in the chat. But, okay. Go ahead, no problem. Okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, um, we can even further uh, push the, uh, the theory. Indeed, the theory predicts that uh, the derivative of the response of prices uh, with respect to odd moments, as for example, the mean and the skewness, calculated at zero mean and skewness, must be equal to zero. This means that uh, other moments are the mean and the skewness should not explain the propagation of monetary shock. We can even also uh, uh, run a regression in which we add these two moments and we can also add the standard deviation of prices. Also, these moments should not be informative of the uh, propagation of monetary shock. To do this, we run a uh, a regression of the response of prices over a constant plus the ratio of the kurtosis and the frequency plus uh, the mean, the standard deviation, and the skewness of price changes. Uh, the results of uh, this specification are reported in this uh, table. This table is still only using producer prices data. The column of the the columns of the table are, this, are exactly the same as the previous two tables. In the first row, we see that the coefficient of the ratio of the Kurtosian frequency, also in this case, is still statistically significant different from zero and positive. Furthermore, the coefficient is very similar, is very close to the one that you obtain in our first regression, which was the regression in which we were not including the mean, the skewness, and the standard deviation. From the second, the third, and the fourth uh, row, you can see that other moments are not statistically significant in explaining the propagation of uh, monetary shocks. Until now, until now, uh, I have only uh, speak about the result for producer prices. Now I uh, go through the result using consumer prices. The results are shown in this table, but we report only the, uh, the main two uh, regression that we've shown. So we, in the top panel, we report the result from, uh, uh, the result from uh, uh, regressing the response of prices over the ratio of kurtosis and frequency. In the bottom panel, we report the results when we regress the response of prices over the uh, frequency and the mean. From the first row, we can see that in this case, uh, in the majority of the, ca uh, the cases, 
the coefficient of the Courtauxian the frequency is positive and statistically significant. Uh, however, this is not the case in the first two columns. In the first two columns, yes. Five more minutes. Yes, have thank five you. Minutes. Yes, thank you. Uh, furthermore, we can see that the uh, constant in the in the top panel, also in this case, is uh, uh, positive and statistically, uh, sorry, is negative and statistically significant different from zero. Uh, in the bottom panel, uh, we can see that the coefficient on the frequency in all our specification is still negative and statistically significant different from zero. The, uh, instead, the coefficient on the kurtosis is uh, always positive, but is statistically significant in the majority of the cases. This is not the case when we uh, look at the third and fourth column. Uh, we believe that uh, the results for uh, CPI uh, are weaker than the one of, uh, of uh, PPI because uh, we, uh, in CPI we have some sectors with lots of uh, uh, discounts and the sufficient statistic result does not hold when we uh, does not hold in a model with uh, discounts. Uh, indeed, not reported, but when we run a regression excluding uh, a regression for CPI excluding clothing and foods, the result for CPI are much more in line with the one of PPI. Uh, let me conclude. In this paper, we have uh, provided an empirical test for the sufficient statistic result. We have done this exploiting the uh, across sector variability uh, using PPI and CPI data. Uh, we have found evidence for uh, the sufficient statistic, in particular using PPI. Our results for, uh, are less robust when we use consumer data. What we have found is that the ratio of the Courtauxian frequency has the predicted sign and is statistically significant different from zero. Furthermore, we couldn't reject the hypothesis that the coefficient of the Courtauxian frequency have the same effect in magnitude, implying that also the Courtauxian is important in explaining the propagation of modal shock, which is exactly the novelty behind the sufficient statistic proposition. Furthermore, we have also found that other moments, as they mean the skewness and the standard deviation, are not seen statistically significant in explaining the propagation of Monday shock. Our results, uh, all for, rep for several robustness checks uh, that I got, I, we have not reported here, for example, uh, they hold when we remove potential outliers of the uh, response of prices or of the cryptolis or of the frequency. We, we believe that the results for CPI are weaker because in CPI there are some sectors that uh, have lots of discounts and the sufficient statistic uh, result does not apply in a model for with discounts. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy to answer any question later, but now there is the presentation of Peter. Peter, the floor is yours. Okay, so, so, so thanks a lot. It's, it's great to be here. It's a joint work with Raphael Schönle and Jesse Wurston, um, and uh, who, who might be here, you know, answering some of your questions if you, if you have during during the the, the presentation. So so the paper is is about uh, measuring price selection in in micro data. And uh, the the question is that we are revisiting is is basically a classic question. So in it, the rig, it's, it's that the rigidity of price level influences the real effects of monetary policy as well as the amplification through through demand channels. And we know from previous research that prices change uh, infrequently. And in standard models, low frequency actually implies that the price level is rigid. However, in, in, micro, in, in models which are microfunded by fixed uh, menu cost of adjustment, uh, the price level can stay flexible even if a small fraction adjusts because large price changes are going to be selected. And, and why, is, why is this the case? The, it's because of the menu cost, it's, it's optimal. So it's, it's a fixed cost of adjustment. So if you need to change prices, it's optimal for you as a price setter to concentrate on the most uh, mispriced products. And then when an aggregate shock hits, the adjusting prices are going to be those that are most mispriced, 
And because of this, they change a lot and this together. So the interaction of the, of the individual mispricing and the aggregate shock is going to raise the flexibility of pr the price level. And this can potentially be so big as, as to, to make uh, monetary policy completely ineffective in, in, in influencing the, the real economy. So in this paper, we are going to revisit this uh, Golosov and Lucas critique to price rigidity by establishing new facts using microdata. So we are going to generate proxies for, for mispricing. We are going to identify aggregate shocks and we are going to measure selection as the impact of this gap and shock interaction. So a micro macro interaction on the probability of the price changes. In particular, we are asking whether is it true that prices with large gaps are changed with higher probability than those with uh, small gaps when, a, when an aggregate shock hits? So in this, in this sense, we are, we are asking uh, whether we are measuring whether selection is present in the data. And what, what do we find? We find uh, actually evidence for state dependence in the sense that the price change probability as well as the size increases with the price gap but we find no evidence of selection. And I'm going to be clear about how, how we define it exactly. But in, uh, in, so what we find is that the gap, the, this mispricing is basically immaterial when an aggregate shock hits. In, instead, the price response, the price level response is going to be state dependent, but through a gross extensive margin. So it's going to uh, adjust through the shift in the, in the share of price increases versus price decreases. That's gonna be the, the, the main uh, state dependence channel. And, and this, we, we find that, uh, that these evidence provides guidance for, for model choice and, and some policy implications. In, in particular, the, the results are consistent in mildly state dependent models uh, and uh, sizable monetary non-neutrality. So, so let me just, just go over to, to, to clarify uh, the, the notions uh, of kind of the main uh, idea behind selection. And for this, let me uh, use uh, an intuitive framework uh, by Cavalier Engel. The, the starting point is that there are price adjustment frictions which are going to lead to lumpy, lumpy price adjustment. And an important uh, uh, state variable uh, the product level state variable uh, in these models is the price gap. So how far the, the, the price of the pro product is from its optimal price. The, the important thing is that the optimal price is, is unobserved. And because of these lumpy uh, so, so kind of costs of adjustment, the, the price of the product only adjusts occasionally while the optimal price is influenced continuously by both product level and aggregate factors. And what comes out uh, from these, from these micro-funded models is that there is going to be a dispersed distribution of this price gap. And this is, this is what is shown on the, on the right, uh, right hand side. So the, the focus of, of our uh, analysis is going to be the shape of the adjustment hazard. So the adjustment hazard is, just uh, reports the probability of adjustment as a function of the gap, as a function of the, the mispricing. And in a, in a simple menu cost model, this, is a, is, this becomes a step function. So for small so, so, uh, uh, gaps below a threshold, there is going to be no adjustment. And above a threshold, there is going to be adjustments with, with probability one. So then together, so the gap density together with the, with the probability, with this hazard function is going to uh, uh, imply the price change uh, distribution. So th that's going to be in this case, uh, the shown in the, in the dark uh, uh, black area. So these are the price decreases. And in this setup, the price changes are going to be large because only those prices change, which are higher, which, which have price gaps, which are higher than this, this uh, uh, inaction, this uh, inaction band or threshold. And importantly, this is not what we call selection. So this is just normal time high uh, price changes. This is actually what we will refer to as state dependence. So this is, uh, but, but in, instead selection is what happens when an aggregate shock hits. So an aggregate shock 
uh, in, in this setup uh, hits uh, by shifting the hazards to the left. And there, then because of the aggregate shock, there are going to be new decreases, which, which are going to appear. And selection is going to be large if these new decreases are large, they are far from their optimum, because these new decreases are going to determine the flexibility of the price level, how, how they are going to influence the, uh, the, the aggregate, aggregate prices. Uh, in, in SS models, these are far from their optimum, the, the new adjusters, so these, these uh, uh, going to be, the, their adjustment is going to be large and the price level is going to be flexible. In Calvo model, there, the hazard is flexible, so there are going to be basically no new adjusters, there's going to be no selection. And what Golosov and Lucas showed that in, in a model with, with large selection, the impulse responses after a monetary policy shocks are going to be, so the real effects, which, is, which are shown here, are going to be smaller and temporary, uh, while in a Calvo model without, without any, any selection are going to be large and, and persistent. So, so selection is really important. Uh, even though here the, the frequency of the price adjustment is, stain, uh, is the same uh, across the, the, the two models. So uh, what we now do in the, in the paper, so, so the data we are, we are I'm, I'm going to show you, but in the paper we also show uh, robustness results uh, using uh, PPI data, is supermarket scanner data. Uh, and we like it because it's very granular. So, so products are identified at the barcode, barcode level. It also has a wide coverage in the US as well as 12 years of, of, uh, of weekly data. So the granularity gives us high quality information about closed substitutes and the time series uh, are, is, is going to give us, uh, uh, so it's long enough to, for, for us to identify aggregate fluctuations. So we are doing some, some standard cleaning in the data. We are uh, filtering out temporary discounts. And we also move from weekly data to, to monthly frequency uh, using the monthly mode to, uh, to, uh, as, as, as monthly prices. So this uh, figure shows how our supermarket price index uh, you know, does uh, in, in the aggregate. The, the orange line shows a CPU, CPI food at home uh, sub-index, while the, the, the dark red uh, line shows the reference price index, so the sales filtered supermarket index. As, as you can see, the, the, the index captures the business cycle variation of the, of the series well. It is not perfect in matching the level of the, of the inflation because it uh, ignores new product introductions. Uh, and uh, and that's well well known, but but this is not something that uh, that that we are focusing on. So our our question is really about what business cycle responses to shocks. So our our starting point is that even though the um, optimal uh, prices at the at the product level, and because of that the gap is unobservable, an important component of it is observable. And, and this important component is, is basically how far a price is from the average price of close competitors after controlling for the competitors or the other stores, uh, kind of per persistent uh, uh, characteristics uh, and, and basically price differences because of regional variation uh, and, and amenities. And the idea here is that stores, when we are comparing the exact same products, stores don't want uh, no mispricing. They, they don't want their prices to be higher than the competitors because then they will face low demand, but they also don't want their prices to be lower because then their markup is too low. They could increase their uh, profits by increasing their prices. So uh, in, in particular, what we do, we take the sales filtered reference prices and calculate the gap as I said, as a difference from the exact same product from the, the price of uh, in, in, uh, in competing stores. And uh, also we are uh, controlling for a, a store fixed effect uh, by, by calculating just the fixed effects regression uh, of the form here uh, seen, seen on, this, on this slide. So with this, we are 
eliminating permanent differences in, in, in store, uh, store pricing. And in our uh, analysis, we are also going to use lagged gap. In that sense, it's predetermined. It's, it's before an aggregate shock hits. It's, it's a measure of, of initial mispricing. So, so let me show you some, uh, some data. So here, what we do is, is, is calculate these gaps and just show you the density of, of the gap. And uh, what, what you can see here is that the, the density itself has a, has a really sizable uh, dispersion uh, and, and also, also fat tails, even though we are kind of filtering out sales and, and also store, store fixed effects. The, the most of the, it's also important to point out that most of the, the distribution is between minus 20 and plus 20 percent. So this is uh, this is where the relevant relevant ranges are still. Uh, what 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 we are showing here is uh, the size of the price change, conditional on having a particular uh, price gap. And and what you what you see here is that on average uh, there is a almost one to one relationship between the gap and the size. So if uh, so, so basically on on average when firms change their prices they are uh, closing closing the gap. So in that sense this justifies us using as uh, it as a as a relevant component of the gap. And, and the, the, the last, last figure I'm showing you here is uh, an adjustment hazard in the data. So here uh, you can see the probability of the adjustment conditional on the gap. And, and what you can see right away is that it has this familiar uh, V-shaped form, which is in line with state dependence. Uh, and so it, it, it clearly increases uh, with the distance uh, from zero. Uh, what you can also see is that it's asymmetric. So there is a, a higher probability of adjustment if your price gap is negative. So your price is below your competitor's prices. You, you, you don't like it. So you like it less when, when, when it's above. Uh, and it's also, uh, what, uh, I mean, it's, it's in the eye of the beholder, but we would like you to, to kind of see that, that in the relevant range, so in the minus 20 plus 20 range, it's almost piecewise linear. So there is not much nonlinearity uh, happening in, in, in this range. Actually, it, it, it becomes even, even less if we control for uh, uh, heterogeneity, unobserved heterogeneity uh, using store item fixed effects uh, as, as we do in, in the regressions to come. So now we have this measure of the price gap. Now we need an aggregate shock and for this, uh, because our, our sample is between 2001, 2012, we are uh, concentrating on the credit shock, but we also, in the, in the paper, we also show that the results are robust using monetary policy shocks. And uh, we identify it uh, using timing restrictions uh, following Gil Kristen Zakrajczyk's paper. So we, we use their excess bond premium measure, which is a default free corporate spread and uh, identify credit shocks as uh, a shift, an increase in the excess bond premium without any contemporaneous effect on activity, price, and interest rate. And, and to show you how it uh, looks like uh, in, uh, in the dynamics, so how, how, this, how these shocks looks like, we, we just run uh, a series of OLS uh, regressions, uh, the lo local projections analysis, where we uh, Look, look at how this credit shock influences different aggregate, aggregate variables using a set of controls. And, and for controls, we are using uh, one to 12 months lags of CPI, industrial production, the one year rate and the access bond premium. So how, how, how the shocks looks like. So it, it, if there is a tightening of the credit conditions, the, the access bond premium increases and, and, and stays high, uh, Almost for almost a year, monetary policy eases, but it's not uh, sufficient to offset the real effects of this of this tightening. So industrial production drops, a hump shaped pattern, and core CPI is uh, declining, and the the peak effect of the decline is uh, is uh, around two years after after the shock. If we 
look at for the same shock what happens to the to our supermarket price index we see that the effects are very similar than the core cpi so there is a gradual uh, response but unlike the the core cpi and the peak effect is not before the 24 months so this is we are going to use this 24 months period in our following analysis so with this product level proxy and the aggregate shock we can we can uh, now assess that uh, is it true whether the the new adjusters after a shock have large gaps and we, we do this by uh, looking at selection as an inter interaction of the aggregate shock and the product level proxy in a linear probability of the model of price adjustment. So the, the form of, the, of, the, of our main regression is, is, is the following. So in the, in the left-hand side, we have an indicator of price increases and price decreases separately for a product uh, in a particular store between the current period and 24 months in the future. Peter, and, you have five minutes. Huh? Thank, thanks a lot. And and our, our regressors, so we are interested in whether what what uh, how this uh, adjustment uh, uh, probability influenced by the, the gap, the price gap itself, the aggregate shock itself, and their interaction. And our, our focus is going to be whether the interaction uh, is is significant because if it's significant, it means that over the normal normal effects, large shocks, uh, so so uh, 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 products with large gaps are responds with higher probability than the aggregate. Uh, we are going to uh, run a, 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 a series of controls, aggregate controls as as before. We have uh, also the age of the price as a as a as a control variable, and then we. Uh, satiate the, the regression with, with product store level of fixed effects as well as calendar months fixed effects and cluster the standard errors uh, across categories and time. So this is the main results of the paper and, and we in the, in the paper we have a, a series of kind of a, a lot of robustness tests and, and actually the results stay, stay the same, similar. What we find is that the gap itself has a very, very strong effects on the on the increases, and and it's, it's as expected. So, so a higher gap uh, decreases the price increase probability, and uh, and increases the price decrease probability. The shock itself has also a significant effect. So a tightening of the credit conditions reduces the price increase probability and increases the price decrease probability, but the selection effects or their interaction. Uh, is are, are are not significant and and this is consistent with with a lot of uh, a lot of the the robustness regression. So in that sense, we find evidence for state dependence, the gap raises frequency, and an adjustment in the gross extensive margin in the sense that the aggregate shock shifts the probability of increases versus decreases, irrespective of the gap, basically all all around the, the distribution, but no evidence for for selection. And actually, you might worry that we are imposing linearity, even though this is this is not necessarily the case. Uh, so here, what we are doing as a robustness, we we uh, look at uh, we, we create groups and and run a regression, uh, basically looking at how these different groups respond uh, to to the aggregate shock. Uh, as the function of the gap and as a function of the interaction. And what you see here is that this regression actually justifies our, our assumption of, of linearity. It's, it's not exactly linear, but it's very close to linear. And the effects are, are very significant for the direct effects of the gaps, but stay insignificant uh, for, for the interaction terms. And, and as I said in the paper, we have a series of robustness tests. So how, how do we, uh, so, so what did we learn from this? Peter, we're getting to two minutes. Thanks. So, so what we uh, uh, point out is that is that it's useful to to separate the extensive margin effect that Kabbalah Engel uh, emphasized into a gross extensive margin effect and the selection. And the gross extensive margin is the shift between price increases versus price decreases. And the selection is whether large gaps are adjust with higher probability condition on the shock. And we point out that if you have a, a linear probability model that I'm, I'm showing here, where the where the hazard function is is linear as well as flat, then 
what happens is that an aggregate shock is going to shift the hazard function to the left, but this, this shift is going to uh, have basically the same effect as we have seen in, the da in, in our data. Uh, in particular, there is going to be a uniform shift in the probability of adjustment. Uh, for, so for example, here, the, the, for, a, for a tightening, the decreases go up, but this is going to be uniform uh, across across the the distribution of the of the gaps. So there is going to be no selection. There is going to be the new adjusters are not going to be larger than than otherwise. So so just just to overview the effects, we we uh, argue that our our data points to having gross extensive margin and no selection. This is inconsistent with time dependent models, which have none of them. But this is also inconsistent with the uh, SS models and, and models with strongly convex hazards because they should have both selection and gross extensive margin. In, in, if, if the model is kind of linear or close to linear, the hazard, then it is consistent with the data. In particular, there is no selection, but there is gross extensive margin effect. So, so there is state dependent effects, but not selection. And uh, just to uh, show how our data can be used, uh, we are uh, also looking at, we are taking a model of the shelf, in particular, Woodford's rational inattention extension of the Colossov and Lucas uh, menu cost model, and use it to, to calibrate the density of the, the price gaps and the, and the hazard function to, to, to show that, that then if, if we are you know, using a model, we can use the frame, the, the evidence we have to assess the monetary non-neutrality to, to the Carvo. And, and here uh, you, uh, you can see how the model calibrated to, so how, how, how we kind of managed to calibrate the model uh, to, to get to the, the, the data. Uh, and it's kind of in line with, uh, with, with the evidence. And then, after we calibrated the model, we can ask the extent of monetary non-neutrality. We are doing the same exercises as Woodford did in particular, looking at uh, monetary shocks and how they influence the price level uh, in, uh, in, in a series of, series of regressions. And we are asking how close the, the, the price level reaction is to, to the Carvo effect, to the Carvo case, when this uh, information uh, friction parameter is is very very high, or when this information for friction parameter is very very low, and what we find is that uh, for the calibration that matches our data, the effects are 20% higher than than Calvo, even though in an SS model it, it would be almost uh, so so five five and uh, and a half times as uh, as uh, flexible uh, in in an SS SS framework. So the the estimated information friction parameter here implies high monetary non neutrality. So I'm uh, uh, run out of time, so let me just conclude. So we use a granular supermarket and in a paper also PPI data to measure selection. We found evidence for state dependence in the sense that adjustment probability and the size increases with the gap, but no evidence for selection in the sense that condition on, on, uh, on the adjustment. Uh, sorry, the, the uh, adjustment is independent of the price gap. Instead, the, the state dependent adjustment is, is uh, going through the gross extensive margin. So the shift between increases versus decreases. And, and these results are inconsistent with, with uh, standard time dependent and, uh, and state dependent models, but consistent with widely state dependent models. For example, the one with, uh, with tight information constraints as in, as in Woodford, which uh, also imply size of all monetary non-neutrality. Thanks a lot and looking forward to the discussion. We have a very dense chat, but for now, mostly questions about the first paper. And Francesco has been very active in uh, responding to some of the of the questions as co-author. I think there is still one by Daniel outstanding, which is about econometrics. And um, so Daniel uh, asked about how worried you are, Andrea, about having generated regressors in your regression. What 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 could be the effect in terms of uh, significance of your results?
you're okay you're, no yeah, yeah. no I, I couldn't unmute myself i didn't know why but yeah. <laughs> now i can and the um yeah he's right the the the, gener the requests are generated but uh we have lots of micro uh price change data so we should like be able to estimate quite precisely the the Cortosian frequency and furthermore if that is not the case the case we should have attenuation bias in our in our baseline regression when you run over the ratio so in that case the coefficient should be downward bias and so it just the, the our results should be quite consistent with that but he is right the, the frequency and Cortosian are generated and then there was a, a question where, um, if, if I may, where Francesco already replied partly on Matt was asking about fixed effects. So there, there has been a back and forth in the chat about did you control for fixed effect? But can I add a twist to that, which is something I don't understand um, yet to myself, is when you want to test for sufficient statistics, what is really that test? You know, it's, it's it's within a model. Then what is the role of unobservables, which you would try to capture with, with fixed effects in the test for sufficient statistics? So would you want to saturate or do you think it's actually that that's, distortive? Yeah, exactly. That's that's a really good point that also we try to respond in our paper that for us it's not it's not obvious that you should add fixed effect. Like if there are differences across sector. We want to exactly exploit that difference, and so yeah, our baseline indeed is without fixed effect. When we add fixed effect, our result weaken. But that's also as Francesco was saying because we include like forty dummies and we have one hundred and twenty sectors. So there are lots of dummies for like you end up with every sector as a more in average free. free Free sector, free observation. You know? So it's it's quite normal that the results will be weakened. But I don't know if I answered your question there. To me, yes, I think uh, Matt can write if he's not satisfied. But now we have also a question for Peter from Hervé, uh, which Peter can read, but I read it aloud for everybody. If uh, did you try some form of uh, order probit, Peter, instead of linear probability? Only another chain words, maybe why did you choose linear probability? Uh, yes, so let me try to share a slide um, showing showing those results. So, so here uh, we so as a as a robustness, so this is this is a, a very important question. So linear probability uh, models are, are kind of an approximation and 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 needs to be checked whether whether more more challenging uh, setups uh, are kind of the the results stay stay robust or not. So here we we show results. Uh, the, the ordered probit is the third uh, column, and the the coefficients obviously here cannot be directly compared to 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 the linear probability model, but it but in terms of the the patterns they are they are very similar. So in the, in the sense of of the of the gap having having an expected so it's the same uh, uh, significant effects, the shock itself also having a, a significant effect with with an expected sign and the selection. Uh, staying staying in, insignificant. We also also run regressions with multinomial uh, uh, probit. Actually, here here was the the only point when we uh, the, when when we find actually some some significance for uh, for for the for the selection effect, but it was it was not not very strong and and only for for uh, for price decreases. Uh, yeah, so the detailed results you can you can also find in the paper. So if I see no other really pending questions in the chat, um, more of a discussion maybe also between Anton and, and Francesco I mean, and everybody else as well. I'm person. Okay, so we have from Christiane a question. Peter, what would it take to apply the results on the Prisma data? 
data um, right uh, the methodology well this these are i think part of the prisma data but so, you no. yeah i think, you I think it's a it's a completely yeah. it's yeah. a completely fair Fair question. question. So this yeah. is US. This is now concentrating yeah. on the US data. Yeah. But yeah. we are so just to just to confirm, we are working on uh, looking at a similar uh, analysis using uh, Euro area supermarket data. the The difference there is that for the Euro area data, we don't yet have long enough time series to to run a run this kind of selection analysis. So analysis of both. both uh, so combining the cross section with the uh, the aggregate shock. Instead, what we do is is document the cross sectional moments and then uh, look at so kind of identify the the parameters uh, of of a theoretical model and and then then try to draw comparisons between the US and and your area. And the, the work is in progress, so we we, we don't yet have uh, uh, you know, results. But we are close, so I think hopefully I'm, I'm going to be able to to report uh, the, these results soon enough. And unfortunately, we had a big shock. So as we get the data from 1920 and so on, no? that 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 will help. Um, Peter, you you have a question from Alexander Jung from the ECB. You can read it off, or I can read it off. How dependent are your results on the selection versus state dependent on the data set? And then the pricing may be different on geographic levels. Uh, yes, so I think I think that's uh, that's fair. Um, what uh, what we what we tried so so in in some sense our how we compare prices is we compare it nationally, uh, but because we want kind of a good, large enough comparison, but we control for for kind of permanent differences in in geography. So we control for store store fixed effects. So I, I in in that sense uh, we are taking into account some of some of this heterogeneity, but it's true that that in our with, with our data we could. Uh, Actually, run robustness looking at only only certain geographies, certain markets, how how it goes, but how, how it how it does. We haven't done it yet, but then we need to restrict attention to goods which have enough, which which are kind of more popular, which are more available in in in, in more of the the stores. But but I think it's a good idea. We sh we should we should probably do that. Thank you. So we have, and it will have to be the final question, I'm afraid, from Christoph, on evidence that once the gap is adjusted, firms remain on the average price level or they move around it. Um, or they just start building another gap. Yeah, so so I mean, what what evidence we showed is that on average, they close the gap. Uh, over two year, over two year horizon. So in that sense, uh, you should, and conditional on changing, they are they are they are closing it. Uh, after after that, uh, so we, we haven't really looked at kind of dynamics after after this the, what well, this gap uh, gap happened. I, I accept I, I expect this gap to be opened up again over time, and then then closed again. So I think it's not. Uh, uh, so, so they are going to adjust only only regularly, but but this is this is something we we, we need to 